Hi, I'm Mark Priestley. After a life spent in the elite environment of the Formula One pit lane learning how to win, this podcast aims to bring that elusive, high-performance culture into your daily lives. In this week's episode, we look at Sebastian Vettel's retirement announcement and how his words could be a stark reminder to all of us to think more about how we define ourselves and others. Plus, I've got some tips on how to motivate yourself when there's no one else around to push you. Welcome back to Pit Lane Life Lessons. Talk about how Formula One teams are so successful. Tiny things. But you only find those tiny things when you look for them. Of course, there's only one winner in every Grand Prix, so for everybody else, you haven't won, so it could be deemed that that's, that's a failure. Hey everybody and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Pit Lane Life Lessons podcast. As ever, thank you so much for joining wherever it is you are in the world, however it is you're listening, whatever it is you're doing whilst you're listening to this. Thank you. I appreciate every single one of you. Uh, It is Friday evening of the Hungarian Grand Prix weekend as I record this episode of the podcast. I've spent a day in the commentary booth for the BBC commentating on the practice sessions and perhaps as expected, much of the talk during those practice sessions was centred around Sebastian Vettel and the news this week of his announcement that he will retire from the sport at the end of this season, 2022. Uh, He has laid out his reasons for doing so. It's obviously a big decision, one he's thought about long and hard and come to this conclusion being the right conclusion for him. None of us can argue with that. But what I wanted to explore or talk about further were some of the reasons that he set out uh, in his little video, his announcement that he made to announce this news to the world. He set out some of his thought process behind making the decision. And the reason I wanted to get into it, really, because I thought it had value to us, was because some of the things that Sebastian Vettel said, I think are a stark reminder to all of us about how we should think about the way we treat other people, about the way we view other people, about the way we sort of pigeonhole other people and define the people around us. Because Sebastian's message, a large part of it was centred around showing the person that Sebastian Vettel is. He talked in his own words around how He spent so much of his life in the spotlight of of Formula One. You know, he's been a racing driver. We all know him as Sebastian Vettel, the racing driver, the Formula One driver, the four-time world champion Formula One driver. We now know him as a Formula One driver who likes to speak up on certain issues that are important to him. The idea of diversity and inclusion and sustainability and the environmental crisis that we're all facing, climate change. He's an activist in today's world, but he's still a racing driver who chooses to speak up on those issues. And the point that I think Sebastian Vettel was trying to make in this video to some extent was that he's far more than just a racing driver. And the elements of his life that we don't typically see on a Grand Prix weekend, when we flick our televisions on on a Sunday afternoon, we only see Sebastian Vettel, the racing driver. But of course, that's a tiny fragment of his life. It's a tiny fragment of who he is and what makes him up. And it felt like this video was his opportunity or his attempt to just shed a little bit of light on the wider person that Sebastian Vettel is. Pointing out things like that his favourite colour is blue, that he likes chocolate, that he likes the smell of freshly baked bread, that he likes being outdoors. All of these elements of his character that no one in his Formula One days ever really asks him. Because the only questions he ever gets asked are, how's the car feel? You know, where can you get to on race day, given that you've only qualified in 10th place? How does it feel to be this far down the grid? What are the biggest challenges you've got this weekend? How are you going to look after your tyres? What can you do from here? Reflect on today's race, Sebastian. All of these questions are about Sebastian Vettel, the racing driver. It's the only part of this human being that we ever get to see or hear about. It's the only part I'm sure that he feels that anyone that ever asks him a question is interested in. Inside the world of Formula One, the only interesting subject to most people is Formula One. It's what Sebastian's experiences were in the car, what his predictions are for the weekend, what his sensations were behind the wheel, what his 
thought processes about the team and how the race weekend might unfold. They're all Formula One questions because Sebastian Vettel's a racing driver. But actually, what we now know, and what we should all know anyway, but what's been made abundantly clear to us through his message, and this is where I think we all can take some value from this in thinking differently about our own lives and the people around us, is that Sebastian Vettel is way more than just a racing driver. Of course, it's a large part of his life. It's the most public part of his life. But it's not the biggest part of his life. It's actually a relatively small part of his life when you look at the big picture. And he was pointing out all of these character traits, all of his likes and his dislikes, these elements that make up the person that is Sebastian Vettel outside of racing. Because as he so eloquently put it in his retirement video announcement, he doesn't define himself as a racing driver. And I'm sure Sebastian would love to see the world not define him as a racing driver. And this is where he sees his future. He sees his future as something much bigger than just being a racing driver. And this video was an attempt to point that out to us all. He gets in this set of clothing, this race suit, these overalls, the race boots on a Grand Prix weekend, and people jump to that conclusion. They assume, they pigeonhole him as a racing driver. Yet when he goes home on a Sunday evening, he's ditched the race suit. He flies home, he probably walks through his front door to his children and his wife, and he's not a racing driver then. He's a father, he's a husband. He's just a guy whose job happens to be driving a racing car. And right there is the message that we should all take something from, because how many of us do exactly that? How many of us define either ourselves or the people around us, the people we come into contact with, by our first impressions of them, by what we see, what we see they're wearing, the way they speak, the way they behave, the way they act, the way they live, their jobs, the people they hang around with. These are elements of what make up people, not what defines them. It's not the whole picture. And this is the point here, because how many of us, and look, I'll hold my hand up and, and hold my hand up and say I'm guilty of this myself. How many of us have walked down a street, for example, let's say, and seen a homeless guy sheltering in a doorway, you know, in a sleeping bag, surrounded by cardboard boxes, big scruffy beard, dirty clothes, probably smelling a little bit, maybe begging for money. How many of us when we walk past that guy, and we've all done this, how many of us stop and say hello? How many of us say good morning? How many of us reach out or give him a smile? I bet not very many. And why is that? That's probably because we have become conditioned to define that person by that image that we see as we walk past him in the street. Most of us will instantly build our own picture, our own version of events as to how that guy ended up living the way that he lives today, how he ended up in that doorway. And I would imagine, and this is my own experience of this, probably there's an element of fear. Because if we reach out to that guy and if we say hello and ask how he's doing or stop for a quick chat, which we might do if we bump into somebody in the coffee shop. If we see somebody coming through the door the other way, we're quite likely to say good morning, say hello. We'll exchange a knowing glance or a smile, give each other a nod. And yet we don't do it to the guy who sat in the doorway, probably because we have defined that person's character by what we've seen in that snapshot of time. And that's all it is, a snapshot of time in that person's life. Quite often even a misleading snapshot of time. Because the fear that we generate in our own minds about what might happen if we do reach out and open up and say hello, even give that nod or that smile, say good morning to that person, the fear probably is that well, that person must be an angry character, a frustrated character, somebody who has frustrations with society because look at the, the cards they've been dealt. They're going to be angry at me, this kind of middle class guy walking down the street with a takeaway coffee and a smart suit and a nice pair of shoes. They're not going to want to engage me with me. They're probably going to be aggressive in reply to my good morning comment. Why on earth do we think that? Why on earth have we jumped to that conclusion based on this tiny amount of information that we've got from looking at the situation this guy happens to be in in that moment. 
I mean, there could be all manner of different reasons why that person is in that situation in that moment in time. And we don't know any of those. The point is, we define that person as a homeless bum or an aggressive or an angry, probably a drunk, not somebody that we want to engage with because it's only going to cause us trouble. We might not get the reaction that we want or that we hope for. We'll probably get a reaction that's going to ruin our day, that's going to drag us into a situation we don't want to be dragged into. So actually, I'd rather just keep my head down and walk on. In reality, we have no idea who this guy is. He could be somebody who could actually enrich our lives if we got into a conversation. We don't know anything about him, but we're not prepared to find out, so we're just going to keep our head down and keep going. We have defined him already with a tiny amount of information that we've already seen as we walk past him in the street. And this is the point that Sebastian Vettel's making. We define people way too easily on the tiny bits of information that we have about people's lives. Some of us are willing to open up and share much of our lives, but we do it through social media. And in the same way that Sebastian Vettel is talking about through his life as a racing driver and how that's a very public life and people only get to see that in a public forum, social media now is a way that we can choose to share elements of our life with the wider world, with the public. But of course, we open ourselves up to becoming defined by the things that we share on our social media channels. In exactly the same way, the elements that people get to see of other people on social media, first of all, is a tiny snapshot of their lives, but also it's a curated snapshot. It's a snapshot of photographs or videos that somebody's chosen to put out there, perhaps because they would like to be defined in a certain way. It doesn't mean that actually is a definition of their character, of the person that they are. And that is a part of the problem with society today. We choose to be defined in certain ways. We desire to be defined in certain ways. And quite often those ways are not the true character. They're not our true personality. We want somebody to see a version of ourselves and we want them to define us a certain way through seeing those images. It's a distorted and twisted society that we're creating in that sense. But also the other way round... We see these images, we see these videos, we see this content that's out there and we make our minds up about who the person is that's behind that account. We do it with celebrities all the time. We think we know these people and Sebastian is a perfect example of this. We think we know Sebastian Vettel because we've seen him so frequently. He's in our front rooms every Sunday afternoon. He's being interviewed. We get a little window into his life every Sunday And yet we don't. We get a little window into a tiny part of his life, the Sebastian Vettel that is a racing driver. That's the only bit we get a window into. And it's the same when we determine who we think people are through the little window that is social media. The pictures and the videos are a tiny portion of what makes somebody up. And yet we jump to all manner of conclusions about who they are, what type of person they are. And you might say, well, look, that's what you've got to expect. If you're a celebrity, if you're somebody who's willing to share portions of their life online with the wider world, you've got to expect people to jump to conclusions. But what about if it was you? What about if you'd spent three years saving hard, not going out, sacrificing, buying the things you want, sacrificing an extravagant lifestyle to put money aside so that eventually after three years, you could afford a holiday? Not an extravagant holiday, but a holiday, maybe a family holiday, maybe a holiday with friends. And finally, that day comes and you're so excited. You're so proud of the fact that you've earned this. You've saved up to be able to afford it. And on holiday you go and you start posting pictures back from your sunset vista, from the poolside bar that you might be enjoying margaritas with your friends. And you start sharing those pictures on Instagram. What about if somebody else who's in a very different life situation is looking at those pictures and jumping to conclusions about you? What about if they are saying, look at this posh twat flaunting their success online? I'd love to be in that position, but we can't all afford holidays. And look at this idiot. What about if 
somebody looks at those pictures who's a, a recovering alcoholic, who suffered for alcoholism for a large part of their life. Maybe they see you flaunting the alcoholic drinks, showing off about them, massive grins on your face, having this big party time with your friends, and they interpret the image a totally different way. That's you flaunting what to them might be poison, might be an evil drink with alcohol in it. Now, it's an extreme version of what I'm saying, but it's two very different worlds, two very different lifestyles colliding in this virtual world and one jumping to a massive conclusion about the other, defining that person through a series of images, a tiny snapshot of information, which is all they've got available to them. But even with just that fragment of data, they've defined who you are. It's not fair, is it? It's not a true representation, and yet we all do it. We define people based on what their job is. We define them on the house that they live in, the car that they drive. We make assumptions. We take one element of who somebody is and see it as a definition of their character. And this was the very point Sebastian Vettel was making. When you step away from your work environment, where you may be in a, a really powerful role, in which you have to be tough and resilient. You have to be brutal at times. You have to be ruthless, perhaps, to get the success that you and your business needs. That might be a very different character to the one that walks out of the office and then walks back home through the door to your loving children, where you become soppy and soft and kind-hearted and caring. Very different characteristics that might be on display when you walk through the office doors the next day. All of those elements, plus all of the others in your life, go into who you are. And yet certain people only see certain versions of you. We can't define each other by that little bit that we see. Somewhere in our minds, we will all have a vision of what a corporate CEO looks like. What sort of person that is. What a, an accountant, a chartered accountant. What sort of person is a chartered accountant? What about a creative director? Many of us will have a vision of who that is in our minds. The guy that sweeps the streets or collects the bins every week outside your own house. What kind of guys are they? What sort of people are they? And my point is, we have absolutely no idea. We have no idea. The guy who collects the bins on a Friday may well be the perfect dinner guest for a dinner party that you and your friends would host. And yet, you're much more likely, perhaps, to invite the CEO because that's the obvious fit, because you're all successful people. But we have no idea of the character of that CEO. We have no idea of the character of the guy that collects the bins or anybody else that we meet. And until we start opening up and waiting for more information, searching for more information, if we see a benefit in it, if we want it, being open to receiving more information, giving more information if we feel comfortable about ourselves, but not judging people on the tiny amount of information that we have. Now, the other element of what Sebastian Vettel touched on in his retirement video was this idea of defining himself. He went on to talk about how he can't really define himself yet, and he wants to go about learning who he is. He wants to explore his own character further. He wants to become more aware of who he is. He wants to grow into a, a better father, a better husband. He wants to do more of those things that he thinks he likes, but he doesn't yet have enough time and spare capacity to put enough energy into really exploring them in the depth that he'd like to go. He can't even define himself and yet so many of us have defined him as solely a racing driver. And this is another area that I think we should all think more about, because actually one of the most destructive processes that many of us go through is just that, is defining ourselves. We often internally define ourselves by some of the things that have happened to us in our lives. We say that we're not very good at maths. We say we can't draw. We're not a very good artists. And that might be because we've struggled to draw certain things that we've tried to do. Being an artist encompasses a huge number of different things or can encompass a huge number of different things. There may be elements of art that we might be incredibly good at, yet we haven't yet tried. 
And yet maybe one day our teacher told us that we weren't very good because we didn't get a good mark. And because we have defined ourselves as not being good at art, not being artistic, we might steer our lives away from anything related to being artistic for the rest of our days. Think of the opportunities we could miss out on with something like that. And that's one tiny example. The same goes for things like cooking. We tell ourselves we're not a good cook because we maybe haven't learned to do it yet. It's not a defining character trait of ourselves. It doesn't mean that's us. We're the guy that's not a very good cook. If we define ourselves by things that have happened to us, by things that we've done either well or badly in the past, we narrow the opportunity for growth in the future. We restrict our lives because of the stories that we tell ourselves about who we are based solely on some minor incidents that might have happened some singular incidents that may have happened at some previous time in our lives and think of the chances that we might miss out on because we've convinced ourselves that we can't do it. We're not going to be very good at it, so there's no point in trying because that's just not who we are. I don't buy into that in any way, shape or form. What I agree with Sebastian Vettel on here is that we can't define ourselves because we're a constantly evolving entity and we should be open to being constantly evolving. We should encourage ourselves to continuously evolve, to explore ourselves and our character even further. I've talked so much about not being willing to explore the character of others, not being willing to open ourselves up to learn more about other people and jumping to conclusions. It's even more destructive when we do that to ourselves. And it's way more common than you think. We've all got things. Think about it right now. Think about the things that you would define yourself as. If somebody asked you to define you, what would you say? you'd probably rattle off a list of things you're good and bad at, the type of person you are. And yet that will continually change through your life. You will explore those avenues. You will explore new avenues. You should explore new avenues. Sebastian Vettel is retiring from Formula One to do just that, to explore avenues that he wants to find out more about, that he wants to improve in his own lives, the things that he thinks are important to him, but at the moment he can't dedicate enough time to. If we all had that viewpoint, we don't all have to retire from our careers to do this. But if we have a mindset of being undefined, of remaining undefined, of giving ourselves room for growth and expansion and leaving that definition until our final days, only then can we define who we are because our story is only half written. And that's the point. Even the very word definition by its nature is restrictive. It leaves no scope for evolution or interpretation. And yet we use that definition, a definition that we create for ourselves and about others to define who somebody is, to judge that person, to complete the story in our own minds of who it is we're looking at, of who it is that's sitting across the table from us, sheltering amongst cardboard boxes in a doorway that we pass on the street. We've completed the story that hasn't even been written yet in their lives, and yet we have made it up. We have completed it. We've drawn it to a close and rubber stamped it shut. We now know who that person is. We've made up our minds, and we're going to treat them accordingly. If we define other people, we leave no room in our minds for our opinions of those people to change or to grow. It can be destructive in that way, but also, and perhaps even more destructively, if we allow other people to define us, quite often what can happen is we can start to buy into ourselves that narrative. We can start to believe that definition that others are using of us. And this is where Sebastian Vettel is fighting back. Because imagine if Sebastian Vettel allowed himself to believe that he was just a racing driver, because that's what the world sees him as. That's what the world talks about him as. So many people see Sebastian as just that, a racing driver and nothing more. Imagine if Sebastian, over time, was beaten down and began to believe those opinions and those definitions himself. Imagine if Sebastian began to see himself as just a racing driver. And then his career comes to an end and then he wants to retire and he wants to go off and do something else. 
But how can he? Because the very thing that defined him would be lost from his life. He would no longer be a racing driver. And yet that is what the world had told him he was. So how can he go on? How can he go on past that and be somebody else? How can he have a life of fulfillment and meaning when the very thing that gave him fulfillment and meaning was gone? The racing driver element of his life was over. That part of the story was now complete. And yet there's no room for him to write the next part of his story because he's boxed himself in as a racing driver. And you will be amazed how many people do exactly that. Professional sports men and women are prime candidates for this because they have the eyes of the world on them. They have this whole fan base, this media storm around them for much of the height of their careers, where everything's so laser focused on whichever sport, whichever career they had. If you're a movie star, then of course you're defined as a movie star. But what about when you're no longer a movie star? What about once you've retired from that business? What about when people stop going to the cinema to watch your movies and you have to think about doing something else? How can you? Because you're a movie star. And this applies to every single one of us as well. If we define ourselves by the things that other people see us as, the accountant, the creative director, the CEO, those things won't last forever. And yet we have a much greater and longer life than the existence of our careers, of our job titles. We may not live in the big fancy house for all of our life. So when that's gone, have we lost what defined us? If we can no longer afford the fancy car at some point in our life, what do we do? Because that was what defined us. That's what people knew us as. I was the guy that drove the Ferrari. If I haven't got the Ferrari, what does define me now? This is why we need to start thinking more about losing those definitions, about keeping the story open because it is continually being written. Our own story, importantly, but we should all start thinking about not closing off the stories of others, not using any snapshot of information that we might see on an Instagram post or a face to face meeting, a chance passing by in the street. Those are tiny packets of data. They are tiny elements of what makes somebody up. One of the privileges of spending so many years in the heart of Formula One and a Formula One team was to get a window into the world of some of the most famous people in that sport. The drivers, of course, some of the big characters, the big designers, the team principals, the big personalities from our sport that fans of the sport only ever get to see the public persona of. And yet I had this privileged window into their lifestyle. I socialised with them. I travelled the world with them. I lived with them at times. I went out and had dinner with them. I had some great times away from the racetrack. I got to know them. And that's the point. I got to know them. And what that did for me was really open my mind to the difference between the public side of somebody that we see, somebody that we define as a Formula One team principal, as a Formula One driver, and the real person behind that mask, behind that character, behind that caricature, as they're often portrayed. There's a real person, there's a real human being behind that, and I got to know many of those people. I even experience it myself to some extent now. I'm in a TV show that plays out to hundreds of millions of people around the world. People see me as this character on the Wheeler Dealer show. And yes, of course, it's me. Yes, it's me being me. But it's only me in a tiny part of my life. And yet, because I'm in people's front rooms, I'm in people's homes every single week all around the world, people think they know me. They message me, they make assumptions, they jump to conclusions. I don't take offence at any of those things. People do that because I'm in their front rooms on so many occasions. It's a natural thing to feel like you know that person. We've probably all done it to some extent. And social media, as I said earlier, is one of those things that just exacerbates that as a problem. But the reality is nobody who watches me on television knows who I am. And I cannot be defined as this person in a show that so many people love. And I now know that from working with people who've had the same experience. I've seen it. I still see it on a regular basis. And what Sebastian Vettel did in his retirement announcement video 
was to clarify that, was to reiterate that. He put it so eloquently. He described himself, so many elements of himself. It's still not the full Sebastian Vettel. Even after watching that video, we can't think we know who he is. We can't define him because he likes the colour blue and he likes chocolate. They are just another element that we may not have known before we saw the video. But it's nowhere near the full picture of who he is. And that is the point. It's a destructive process. It restricts those around us. It stops them from growing. It stops them from growing in our own minds. But it can also restrict us when we are defining ourselves because of the way that people see us because of the things that people have told us, because of our past behaviours, our past accomplishments, because of the things that we feel like we want to achieve, the things we feel we're good or bad at, they still can't define us. And if they do, they will stop us growing in so many areas of our life. So maybe that's something we can all think a little bit more about. Off the back of Sebastian Vettel's message this week, can we think about how that might apply to our lives and the way we treat others. And if we can do that, just a tiny little bit, be a little bit more understanding about who the people we meet in the world are, who the people we see in the world are, perhaps the world could be a slightly nicer, slightly more fruitful place to be. Okay, so I've got a huge amount of respect for what Sebastian said, the way that he said it, the way he's gone through his career, and the way that he's using his platform for good. So I wish him the very best of luck. I hope he gets some success in the remaining 10 races of this season. And I hope, of course, that whatever lies beyond Formula One for Sebastian Vettel brings him a huge amount of joy and happiness because he surely deserves it. He's a great man and a loss to the sport. Now let's move it on. At this point in the podcast, around the halfway mark, it's become customary for me to just give you a gentle reminder to like the podcast, to follow the podcast, to subscribe to the podcast if you can. And if you're enjoying it, please, please, please just give me a rating in the podcast store, especially on Apple. Give me a review. Just a few words. Tell people why this is a podcast they should go and listen to. Let's grow this community. I need your help to do that. And if you can do it, I'll be hugely appreciative of it. I go through them all. I read every single one. You may have noticed I've started sharing any reviews that you guys leave in the Apple podcast store. I've started putting them on my Instagram page, in my Instagram stories, just as a token of appreciation and to try and help others to be inspired to do the same thing and come and join us and listen and be part of this community. That's what I really want to do with this podcast. And as I say, I need your help. So please go and do that if you don't mind. Thank you. Um, Now let's move it on because the other topic that I wanted to cover this week was off the back of a phone call that I had yesterday ahead of an event that I'm going to speak at in September. Now, the reason this was unusual was I often have these briefing calls before I go and speak at these big corporate events to define what I'm going to talk about, just to give me a bit of a brief on what sort of topics they want me to cover, what their biggest challenges are, how I think I can help them. We thrash all that out in a phone call and then I go away and I put together a collection of stories and messages that I think I can deliver to help them on the big day. Now, one of the major topics that I end up talking about a lot, just because of the nature of what I've done in my time in Formula One, working for this huge, successful Formula One team, is I bring the element of teamwork into much of what I talk about. Formula One, as an industry, is incredibly good at teamwork. It's one of its biggest strengths. Formula One teams are exceptional at getting a large number of people to work together, to pull in the same direction, to all pull in a direction that will enable them to have the success they would be unable to have if they weren't working together as a team. They collectively can achieve so much more than anyone would be able to do individually on their own. That's the point of teamwork. That's the very definition of teamwork, isn't it? It's people working together to achieve something they would not be able to achieve to the same level on their own. That's teamwork. And it's such a big topic, a big part of my life, a big part of what I've done, it naturally forms a big element of almost all of these talks that I do. And so I jumped onto the call with these people this week and I listened to what they had to say. And uh, one of the very first things they told me or they asked me not to cover 
was teamwork. They said to me, we appreciate the value of teamwork. We appreciate the benefits. Of course we do. We understand how important it is, but we don't want you to talk about teamwork. We're not interested in hearing about teamwork from an F1 perspective. It doesn't fit in with the narrative of the day of the event, and it's not something we see as being hugely beneficial to the people that will be in the audience. Because what they said was, these particular people, these people that we're bringing to this event that we want you to speak to, they're individuals within our organisation. They are individuals searching for better performance themselves. They're working alone in almost every case. It's them sat at a computer looking at data, looking at numbers, crunching those numbers and making decisions based on what they see. But it's just them at a computer screen. Of course, as with any company, there's a support network in the background. There is a team operating to back these people up. Somewhere down the line, there are larger numbers of people that all feed into the data set, for example, the IT support. Of course, there is a teamwork element to what they do, but the point of this event, the point of the day they want me to come and appear at is to find ways to encourage these people to perform at a higher level on an individual basis. And what they were getting at was they wanted to understand how a Formula One driver prepares. Because, of course, a Formula One driver is part of a wider team, but unlike most members of that team, they don't work in the factory, they don't spend every single day they're not at the racetrack in the office or in the factory amongst the other team members. They disappear at the end of a Grand Prix weekend, and for the most part, they go home. They go off and do their own thing. They are individuals during that period between races. And what they were interested in finding out was how does a racing driver, for example motivate themselves to get out of bed in the morning and go training, to go running or go to the gym. Because what I said to them was, well, there's no rules here. There's no person from the team cracking the whip and saying, right, you need to be at the gym at 7 a.m. and you're not allowed to leave until 1 p.m. When you're in the factory, there are exactly those rules. There are times when you should be clocking in and clocking out. When you go into work, there's times for tea breaks. There's often times for lunch. It's a pretty defined, regimented process, and everybody follows those same kind of rules. But the drivers don't. They're a standalone product of a Formula One team that operate on an individual basis for a large part of their time. And that was what they wanted to try and understand. And whilst my first reaction to their brief was to say, well, hang on a minute, listen, you need to start thinking about teamwork. Nobody can operate on their own and be the very best they can be. Nobody can operate without a team behind them to support them. Nobody can do their best work, achieve their greatest achievements on their own without the support of their team. But then, of course, I realised that whilst that absolutely is important, whilst that has to happen there still has to be an element of getting that person to motivate themselves, to drive themselves, to push themselves harder when there may not be a team in the room doing that. There may not be somebody on the desk next to them. There may not be a group of people around them to encourage them, to push them, to get to their limits and beyond, to deliver things greater than they delivered yesterday because they're on their own. So how do they motivate themselves? And of course, then I realised Formula One's also very good at that. That is something that we all had to learn in Formula One. It's something the drivers, as a great example, definitely have to do. And so we had this large conversation about some of the techniques, some of the tips and tricks, some of the things that Formula One drivers and teams practice to do exactly that, to enable the individuals to continually improve, to push themselves, to get greater results every time they go out. How do they do it? And these are the things that I thought would offer some value to you. So I thought I'd share the contents of our conversation with you here in this podcast. The big one that I thought might have most relevance to many of you is this idea of motivating yourself to go and do something that may not offer immediate results, like going to the gym, something that takes time. You've got to have a long-term commitment If you want to see results in terms of a changing body or a changing fitness level, it doesn't happen after one visit to the gym. And so you need to continually drag yourself out of bed in the morning sometimes, get down to the gym when no one's there telling you to do it. No one's there to see whether you did it or not. So how do you motivate yourself to make that happen continually, consistently? 
How do you push yourself to limits when no one else can see where those limits are? It was something that I've done a lot of work on myself since leaving the McLaren Formula One team, but actually that desire to learn more about it started way back when I was in the McLaren Formula One team. It's something that we did work on within the team ourselves. I know the drivers continually have to go through that challenge for all the reasons that I've just stipulated. But although I was part of a team, a pit stop team, a team of mechanics, a team of engineers, although I was part of that team, I still had to continually improve myself, my own performance. And my team relied on me continually improving my performance as well. Now, I had the benefit of group sessions in the gym, for example. We would all go together. There was a time set aside for us to go and do that. But of course, I had to still learn to push myself even harder. I had to think about what I ate. I had to go running in the evening sometimes because I knew that a healthy lifestyle, that a element and a level of fitness would help me in my job. It was a physical job. I needed those things. I needed to continually learn. I need to understand engineering solutions. I need to continually educate myself. No one told me I had to go away and read books or read studies on certain engineering solutions, material sciences, all of these different things that I felt would offer me something to make me a better part of this Formula One team, I did off my own back. So how do you do those things? Well, this is how I did it. When we think about conveying a message or a communication to somebody, there's a number of ways that we can do that. If it's an important message, we might write it down in a text. We might put in a press release if we're a Formula One team. We might tell it to somebody verbally. We might send it as a voice note to somebody on our phones. There are a number of ways we can get that message across. But in all of those examples... It's just a series of words that convey the message that we want to say. It's using verbal communication or written communication to define what we want somebody to do or what we want them to understand or how we want somebody to understand this message that we're trying to get across. It's a very simple sort of black and white means of communication. Nobody can argue that the information that we need to convey is not there because it's definitely there. It's in that message. It's in that text. It's in that press release. We said it to somebody. Of course, they have that message. So they should understand that message. It should sink in and there's no excuse for not hearing it. But the real challenge in getting somebody to really hear what you're saying, to really have that message sink in, is not necessarily just the words that you've chosen to use, whether you spoke them or wrote them down, but it's how you use those words. It's what you put around those words. It's what kind of narrative you use to convey the message. It's how the person receives the message, which is actually way more important than the message itself. Because if the message hits a brick wall and then bounces off, it's not sinking in. It's not having the desired effect. The message was very, very clear. It was matter of fact. Those words described exactly what we want somebody to hear. But did they really hear it? Did they take it in? Did they understand it? And did it impact them enough to go ahead and act on the instructions or the words or the message that we wanted them to act upon? That's a huge difference. Saying something and hearing that thing are two very different things. An even bigger challenge comes when we need somebody to respond to that message that we've given, to that communication we've given. Well, we need somebody to instigate a series of actions or behaviours as a direct result of those instructions or that communication that we've put out. How do we ensure that somebody takes our message and responds in the right way? And that is where the big challenge lies. That is where this individual performance comes, because although we may not be receiving a message from somebody else when we're lying in bed thinking about dragging ourselves out to go to the gym. We are hearing a message from ourselves. If we're thinking about going to the gym, if we went to bed the night before thinking I'm going to get up in the morning and go to the gym and I set an alarm to do it, we've already sent ourselves a message with a set of instructions. That's what we want to do. And the reason we want to do it is because we want this desired outcome a muscular body, a physical fitness that we crave, that we don't have at the moment. It's going to take a huge amount of work to get to, but we want to get there. So we're going to set an alarm for 6am. And the way we go to bed is we're setting ourselves a set of instructions, which is to get up at 6am, get down the gym and start working out. 
But do we really hear that message? How was that message communicated to us internally? How do we tell it to ourselves? Was it simply a series of words? Was it simply a very basic communication? And how do we ensure that it creates the right response when the alarm goes off? How do we stop ourselves from rolling over when that alarm goes off and hitting the snooze button or turning it off and going back to sleep because no one's there to drag us out of bed physically? And the answer to that question is we have to create an emotive response. We have to give ourselves a reason to get out of bed, to listen to the message that we gave ourselves the night before. We have to give ourselves a consequence of not doing those things. And of course, we all know the consequence is we're not going to get closer to our goal or it's going to take us longer to get to our goal. But how serious is that consequence for us? Because if we skip a day of going to the gym, it's not the end of the world, is it? We'll just go tomorrow and we'll still reach the desired goal, but it might just take us a little bit longer in the long run to get there. That's not the end of the world, is it? But it depends how important that goal is to you. It depends what the outcome is that you're desiring and how much you want it, how much you need it, what consequences it might be to you for achieving the goal. How might it help your career? How might it change your life? And these are the kinds of messages that we need to factor into what becomes a story when we tell ourselves a message. When we give ourselves that set of instructions, when we go to bed the night before, that we are going to be getting up at 6am and going to the gym, just telling ourselves that message might not be enough. And if we're going to struggle with motivation because we're on our own, we're individuals in this particular scenario, What we need to do is create that emotive response. We need to find a way to make sure we buy into a story that we can tell ourselves that ensures that we're going to get out of bed and drag ourselves down to the gym to start working on the challenge we've set ourselves. So this story creation is really the key to motivation. And this is what we talked about on the call because it's exactly what we learned to do at McLaren. It's what so many racing drivers use to do exactly that, to get themselves up in the morning and keep pushing, pushing themselves through pain barriers, through a huge amount of suffering, discomfort, a huge amount of sacrifice. When the world is not watching, it's not being broadcast on a Sunday afternoon. There are no cameras there and they could quite easily get away with not doing it. And yes, I know many of them have trainers to assist in this process, but for so much of a racing driver's life, they are reliant upon their own levels of determination to achieve the things they want to achieve, to be the best. And if you're in a situation, whether it's in work or in your personal life, whether it's health and fitness, whether it's following a diet, trying to lose weight, whatever your goal might be, If there's a competitive element to that, if you're trying to be better than somebody else in your corporate environment, in your work environment, if you're a sportsman and you need to be fitter or stronger than somebody else, you can use these elements of the competition to create the story. And whatever it is you're doing, there are means and ways of creating a story in your mind that generates this motivation to get you up and go for it and push yourself to the limit and often beyond to achieve what you want to achieve. And to give you an example of that, as a Formula One driver, many F1 drivers will be thinking about the other F1 drivers that they're trying to beat. They might think about their teammates. Because if you create a story in your mind that tells you that you're battling your teammate in this F1 World Championship, the world will judge you first and foremost against your teammate who's in the same car as you. You need to make sure you're better than him. And so start to create a story of what your teammate's doing. When you're lying in bed at 6am, what's your teammate doing? Tell yourself a story that your teammate is almost certainly pushing harder than you. He might have got up at half past five that day. He might be already in the gym while your alarm is going off at six. Create a competitive narrative in your mind. That's what they do. Because if you're imagining that your biggest rival is already working hard, is working harder than you, is going to greater lengths than you, and his results are going to start to change at some point because of that level of dedication that he's going to, you can start to improve your behaviors. You can start to change your behaviors. You create this story. A story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
the message of getting out of bed. You're part of that story. You're part of that narrative where you have to get out of bed and go to the gym. That might just be the middle part of the story. That might be the obvious bit. That's the instruction. That's the message you told yourself the night before when you went to bed. The story, the elements that bookend that story are the bits that you can fabricate, you can make up, you can create to enhance the message that's in the middle. The beginning of that story may well be that your main rival is getting up earlier than you. They're working harder than you. They're pushing harder than you. They're going to greater lengths than you. The end of that story might be that your main rival is seeing better results than you, that they're going to get better results than you because they're pushing harder than you, because your alarm went off at six o'clock and yesterday you hit the snooze button. I bet my main rival wasn't doing that. That's the picture you can start to create in your mind and you can make it really visual. And the more visual you make it, the more impactful it will be. This isn't fairy tales. This is telling yourself that if you want to be better than your rival, in a Formula One driver's case, if you want to give yourself the best chance of beating your teammate, you need to be better prepared than them. You need to go to greater lengths than them. You need to be stronger, fitter. You need to spend more time in the simulator. You might need to do more research. You might need to look at more data, speak with your engineers for longer. Because these are the kind of things that are going to give you those tiny advantages. The more details you can put into this story, the more visual and vibrant you can make it, the more impactful it will always be. That's a fact of life. We take in more information that's colourful, that's vibrant, that has pictures associated to it. If we attach a piece of information to a story, we'll remember it. There's a very simple technique. If you want to remember a number, think of a number maybe in the thousands. Open a page of a book. Pick a number in the page of a book. And let try this now. Do it. Take a book from somewhere around you. Open it on a random page. Tell yourself the number of that page in the bottom. That's an inconsequential number to you. There's no way or no reason you should ever remember that number three months from now, six months from now. But if you take that number and create a picture around it, create a story around it, create a rhyming set of words or a song or a poem, or some kind of nursery rhyme where that number could fit in, look at that number and tell yourself a story that incorporates them. Talk your way, literally talk your way through a story that leads the first number to the second number. Create characters out of those numbers. Make the first number meet the second number on a walk through your woods. And then they go on together to meet the third number. Whatever it might be, it sounds crazy. But when you start to visualize those numbers in a different scenario, when you put a story around them, when you make them vibrant and visual, you'll create an opportunity to remember the numbers. And do it. Do it right now. Try it. And in three months or six months time, set a reminder in your phone that just says, what was the number? What was the page number? And I bet many of you, if you've created a good story around that number, if you've used your imagination in the best way possible to enhance that story, to give it something that means something to you, to make it personal to you, to have a reason to remember it, in six months' time, you'll still remember the page number. A number that means nothing to you on its own, but because you've put it into a story you'll remember it. And exactly the same thing can apply to a message that you need to tell yourself that might be important, but not important enough on its own to generate this response that you need, to generate an emotional response, a response that drags you out of bed in the morning. Whereas when you create the story around it, a powerful story that's visual and vibrant and full of colour and full of emotion, when it's a story like that, the effect that it can have on dragging you out of bed, motivating you to go and do it, can be enormously powerful. And believe me, I do it. I've done it. I do it every day. I have exactly that problem. I drag myself out of bed in the mornings to go to the gym, to do my workout. There's nobody telling me to do that. There's nobody going to know if I don't. But I tell myself stories about how future me might be fitter, might be more healthy, might live a longer life, might be able to do more things with my kids, might have a slightly more muscular body when that's what I'm after, might look good on the beach. Tell yourself whatever you need to tell yourself to make it work for you. 
but I start to create this story around that narrative, around that message that I need to get out of bed in the morning to go and do what I got to do. I tell myself a story and every morning when I wake up, the first thing I think of is that story and I get out of bed. And it's not flawless. There are days when I haven't got out of bed. There are days when I've hit the snooze button, as every racing driver will even have. But those are few and far between. And when they happen, you refer back to the story. You fit that into your narrative. You go back to the story. You add this new piece of information in where yesterday you didn't do it. What was your main rival doing? I bet your main rival got out of bed. I bet they didn't hit the snooze button. That might create them an advantage. Now I might have to work harder to claw back that advantage that I need. This is a powerful tool. Believe me, it's a powerful tool. So powerful that some of the world's best racing drivers use it. Some of the world's best sportsmen use it. Businessmen and women use it. And you can use it in whichever element of your life you need to get a message across to yourself. A powerful, important message that on its own as a series of words would have nowhere near the impact that you need it to have. I mean, how many people have done exactly that? Told ourselves, we must remember to, I don't know, do our accounts. We must remember to email so-and-so. I've been meaning to do it for ages. I must remember to do that tomorrow. I must remember to buy my wife a birthday present. That one's happened to me on many occasions when I've forgotten. So look, these things are are important to us, but sometimes not seemingly important enough to always be at the forefront of our minds because so many other things come in. So many other things can end up taking preference. And the thing that we've told ourselves we need to do gets buried. It gets lost. It becomes less important. It becomes easier to not do it than it is to do it. We can tell ourselves some kind of story. We can create a picture, a narrative, a story, a nursery rhyme, however it is we want to do it, to visualise it and to make it emotive for us, to create the top and tail to the message to make it something that we can't afford not to do. Think about it yourselves. Think about how you might apply that to your lives and the things you have going on in your lives. But believe me, I told it to this company this week. They've bought into the idea. I'm going to see the people in their business in a few months time and we are going to talk about exactly this technique amongst others. It will work for big corporations, big business. It works for men and women who are at the top of their game in sports, but it can also work for you. So have a think about how you might apply it to your life and I'd love to hear how you get on. That's it, folks, for this week. I want to thank you all again. I really mean it. Every time I say I appreciate you joining me, it's from the heart. I mean it from the bottom of my heart. I'm going to appeal to you again to like and follow and subscribe and engage with the podcast. But really importantly, please do leave me those reviews and ratings in the Apple Store. It's just a click and a couple of words and it means the world. And I will give you this in return this week. If anybody wants to leave a review for the podcast, I will assure you, I will commit to posting every single one on my own Instagram channels. If you want to put your Instagram handle or your Twitter handle in the review in the podcast store, then I'll happily give you a shout out as well while I do it. Whatever I can do to show my appreciation, I know it isn't much, but if that helps in some way, then I would love to do that for you. So please do take a moment to do that. It means the world. Um, I would also ask you this week to go and check out the Seedstream app. That's an app that I've created with some friends of mine. There's a Formula One app that congregates all of the best Formula One content in one place, from news stories and articles to podcasts to videos to Instagram and social posts, all around one subject or one topic from the world of Formula One. You get that served up in one simple place. And there's also a great opportunity for you to engage with me and with other content creators to join the community, make your predictions ahead of a race weekend where you get points for getting them right, as well as popping your own questions and stories in there too. It's something that we're very proud of creating. We think we've created a really strong app. It's just had a major update, which is why I'm telling you about it. We've had a lot of new users join the platform in the last couple of weeks, and I'd love you to be one of those. So search Seedstream. I'm going to put a link in the description of this podcast. Feel free to go and check that out. And I hope you enjoy it. I'd love to hear your feedback. 
Have a wonderful week, guys. And whatever it is you're up to, remember this. Do the right things and do the things right.